and a very restful Sabbath to you. Amen. Now I say a very restful Sabbath to you because it must be understood clearly. Many of us are not resting on the Sabbath day. We can be here not resting, all right? So I want to make sure that we're resting. We're resting, and we should be resting because like Sister Raquel Beautiful is saying, we have so many things to thank God for. You know, we're told in Matthew 6 that take no thought what you shall eat or drink or wherewith else shall you be clothed. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. And because he knows, he's gone ahead before we've even asked and provided them. Long before. So we have reasons to be thankful every day. We want to thank him for having provided for us. This morning, it's good to be here. It's really good to be here to see you. Sister Antoine. Sister Antoine, you know I'm going to have to call on you a little bit. Because that smile is always missing. And uh, we're glad to have you. I speak representatively. We're happy to have you with us today. And to have you fellowship with us. And may I join with my uh, fellow worshiper, Sister Domingo, and welcome you all to the house of the Lord. I want to um, make a representative statement. I believe I can. That is, speak on the behalf of all of us. And I want to make three points that I think I am able to collectively speak to that we will be in agreement with. The first one is, we're happy to be here today to worship, to praise God. True or false? You know, when we consider, Verna and I, I, I thank the Lord for your devotion. When we consider God's mercy to us, which are mercies which are new every morning, doesn't mean he starts them every day. It, it brings to mind a per, the perpetuation of his mercy in spite of our not recognizing it or not. We have reasons to really worship God from the bottom of our hearts. We're here to worship him because we know who he is. Do we know who he is? Yes. Who is he? Who's God? Repeat with me 1 John 4 and verse 8. Because I'm hearing a lot of things. What is for together 1 John 4 and verse 8? We just, <laughs> we just, that was just our scripture reading this morning. We're having problems already. He that knoweth not, he that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. God is love. The second point I feel very strongly about, or singleness of mind, is we are truly longing for Jesus to come. True or false? Amen. The climate of the world today makes life feel like, for the most part, a laborious drudgery. A life just filled with misery and pain and sadness. I, um, I was telling um, I, the, the, the class this morning, we're having a discussion this morning on the inside, and we're, I was telling them about, I have a, a, an app that just gives breaking news, you know, I don't know why I have it, but I got up this morning at about 5.30 or 5 o'clock thereabout, and um, to check, um, check on the phone so what time it was, I want to see breaking news, bus with junior hockey players had, there's an accident and 14 are presumed dead. And so when we look at the climate of the world today, and when we look at what's teeming, what's happening around us, we're indeed truly longing for Jesus to come. Amen. Now I want us to be very clear in our minds what we're longing for. Because it brings to mind this question, why won't he come? Is he so indifferent to what's happening to us? Is, is, is he not realizing that we're really not having a good time here? Is it that he wants us to continue in this miserable condition? We just read that he is love. Is this how love functions? I want us to be just dialoguing in our minds now regarding these important points because we say we're longing for him to come. 
And were it not for this hope, we would be like those without hope. Yes. True. My third point of collective reference is, I believe that we all affirm in our hearts the words of Romans 8, 35 to 39. I want us just to read these words together as we pray. Romans 8, we're familiar with them, but I believe that we're encouraged always to go back to these words and be, be, be rejuvenated, be refreshed in our minds regarding what they're saying. 35 to 39, we'll read together. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulations or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. May these words never leave our hearts and may they actually be the experience of our hearts as we pray. Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you this morning as a people really desiring for you to come, but there is an issue. There is an issue, Lord, because you, you are not. In fact, you are suffering more for what we are suffering. Open our understanding now. There's something that is needed that needs to be made clear to our minds even now. It's become cliche, but it's the only way for you to come. Speak to each heart. I humble my heart before you, that as I'm used primarily in this capacity, that every word spoken may bring honor and glory to your name. And if there is any trace of self within me, O God, may it be now crucified, that only the thought of Christ be shared with us all. And if there's anything that is said that is not articulated in a proper or in a, in, a, in a manner that can be interpreted correctly. May your Holy Spirit do so for us yes. as we are but, in fi but finite vehicles being used to express to your thoughts. So we await now as we give our minds totally over to you. We await now a word from you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. The first thing I want to tell us is this. This is not just another presentation. This is not just another presentation. Today we will be talking about not by talk but by demonstration. Not by talk but by demonstration. And we will be sharing things that was shared already and we'll be hearing nothing new. But I will again say, this is not just another presentation. Not by talk, but by demonstration. Our scripture reading clearly brings to view, brings home this point. That unless the love of God is seen actively working in our hearts, then there is no evidence that we're Christians. Again. Our scripture reading clearly brings home the point that the love of God in action in our lives is the only evidence of true Christianity. And this is not to be made into a complex issue like we've tried to do with some of the passages of scripture. In other words, there can be no Christianity without the love of Christ evidenced in the life. Note carefully with me these very plain words of Scripture. 1 John 3 in verse 16. 1 John 3 in verse 16. Again, we're looking at not by talk, but by demonstration. 1 John 3 in verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God, 
Because he did what? Laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. The question is, are we ready for that? Are we ready to do just that? To lay down our lives for the brethren. And, and let me say this, we, we, we must not be confused with the meaning of the word brethren, for it does not speak to, and, or, or it's not in reference to, those who are a part of our specific congregation. It actually speaks to the human family. It's from the Greek word adelphos, which means all men. We ought to be willing to lay down our lives for all men. Matthew 5, 44, 45 may make known that fact. Love your enemies so that we can be children of God in heaven. So again, my brethren, this is no small matter. The whole essence of what Christianity about is the Christ-like life. The life that is reflecting the love of God. And no other point is clearly taught or more clearly taught in scriptures than the love of God. And the importance and relevance of the love of God. That is, we read that first John 4 verse 8, that God is love. The essence of the entire being, the entire nature of God is that he is love. And to those who profess to be children of God, the essence of their entire life will be a reflection of that love. Not us speaking about that love. There are many non-believers who speak about the love of God. To be able to speak well about a thing doesn't mean it's your experience. Doesn't mean it's my experience. No other point is more clearly taught in scripture than, the most, than that the most important point of Christianity that is really not given the kind of thought that it should be given is the love of God reproduced in the heart. Turn with me to a very familiar passage of scripture. 1 Corinthians 13. And I just want to capture the verses 1 through 8 with us again this morning. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 8. Notice again, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Have, I'm able to speak angel language and all the languages of the world. And have not love, I'm just a noise maker. That's what the verse is saying. Just making noise. My mom used to tell me empty barrels make the most noise. We're just empty barrels. Mm -hmm. Empty Christian barrels, if I were to put it like that. I want us to prayerfully look at these verses again, brethren. We know them very well. We know them very well. But I want us to prayerfully while we're reading, just keep asking the Lord, please by your spirit, quicken our minds to the deep import of these verses. Look at what the verses are saying. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries. Explain to me the incarnation. Explain to me how God can have the knowledge of all things, eternally past and eternally future, in a state of present tense. The mystery of the wisdom of God. The mystery of the beginlessness and endlessness of God. And the scripture is saying, I might be able to even explain all these things. I understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have, without what is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. In other words, if you want to please God, we, we need to have faith. Yeah, and have all faith so that I can move mountains and have not love, I am nothing. I'm deliberately pausing for us to really give deep thought to these verses. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, that's the easy part. Because, you know, 
I, I can do that. Just give, you know, self-serving, just give it away to look good. This is the part that gets me. <laughs> and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profited me nothing. In other words, there is a sense that we can even get into martyrdom and it's not it's self-serving. Yeah. We can even get into martyrdom and it's self-serving, brethren. Note with me, love suffers long. Are we characterized with impatience? Vernon, you brought to view this morning, 2 Peter 3 and verse 15. The long suffering of God is salvation. Are we impatient with each other this morning? How are we with each other, with our co-workers this week at work? With the people with whom we came in contact with? With those who we have to rub shoulders with every day in the homes? Love suffers long and is kind. Love envieth not, vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own. In other words, seeketh not her own is always other seeking. Love is always other centered. The evidence of love is that you're other focused, never focused on ourselves. And that's why we are able to say from scriptures clearly that God is other centered. Seeketh not her own is not easily provoking. Thinketh no evil. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but in truth. We don't feel or lift it up in our heart when the brother falls or the sister falls or there's a shortcoming that we are aware of. Verse 7. Bear it all things. Bear it all things. Believe it all things. Hope it all things. Endure it all things. Love never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. But love will not love will not see my brethren if the question were asked of us do we love God we would we would unequivocally unanimously say yes but we just sang we thank God for all that he has done and has given and is doing we are able to sing that because he has demonstrated, he has evidenced his love for us by demonstration. So to say that we love God is really cliche. Because we'll talk about this some more. We talk about the great controversy. And when it's really our understanding of what the great controversy is about, we will see that the great controversy cannot be ended by us saying that God is good and that God is love. The great controversy cannot and will never be ended by us just articulating God is good, God is love. Satan is a liar. It can never come to an end. It must be shown, it must be demonstrated, it must be proven that God is such. It is only by demonstration, I mean, there's a place to make mention that God is. But unless it's evidenced in the life, the controversy can never end. It will never come to an end. How do we know that? Well, one of the most liberally used statements that we have in the spirit of prophecy that's used, unless the character or until the character of God is perfectly reproduced in the people, then he will come. He won't come before that. So we therefore see from the Bible's references and our inspirational writings that unless the character of God is reproduced, and we just read clearly taught in Scripture that his character is one of love. And unless that is reproduced in us and give evidence to the unfallen worlds, give evidence to the unfallen angels, give, ev give evidence to mankind, and even to Satan and all his fallen angels that God is indeed love, and that love thinketh no evil, bear it all things, endure it all things, hope it all things, believe it all things, love never fails, the controversy will never end. Because part of the, 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 one of the great issues of, in the great controversy to be resolved is that the love of God cannot be reproduced in a people while in sinful fallen flesh. 
Are we together? It's not by talk anymore, but by demonstration. By demonstration. Some time ago we talked about evidencing how we really feel about something. Evidencing what things are really worth to us. Because, you know, when I look at how we relate to God, when I look at how we behave regarding even or treatment of the services, regarding how we always seem to be willing to talk about how good God is and how we love the Lord. And when we look at the, the evidence of our behavior in relation to what we're seeing, we see that we are really either blatant hypocrites or it's really just a show. I remember sharing this thought, and I'm just going to grab some thoughts that were shared some time ago in addition to some of the thoughts we would like to look at today. Keep me in prayer, because this is me speaking to me first and foremost. Remember I said, Vernon, you like to make videos. Vernon likes to make videos. He has a passion for it. And Huntley likes to make digital images. He loves that. To capture whatever imagery or picture to make a point. He likes to do that. And uh, Alvin, you like to reconstruct cars. Take these old mangled metals and straighten them out and put them on a frame machine and it looks brand new again. And Grandma, she likes to sew. She's always putting new cloth and old cloth, and then the old cloth tears up, so she's always sewing. I don't know, Jesus says you must not put old wine or new wine into old skin, but Grandma has not yet got that parable. Huntley will spend 5000 or more for a new software to make the digital images, but Vernon won't. Whereas Vernon will spend 5000 or more for a new video camera or something like that, but Huntley won't. And Grandma, she will spend 5000 or more for a sewing machine, but Alvin won't. And Alvin will spend 10000 or more for a frame machine, but Grandma won't. Why? And the simple answer is because of what it is worth, each person to each person, what it's worth to them what it's worth to them. I, I want us to really just hone in with me. So some people might even describe the amount of money spent as wasteful or indiscriminate, lacking in judgment or thoughtfulness when they see that happening. Why would you spend so much for a sewing machine? Because, Auntie Jenny, it's not worth that to you. And you might even be tempted to think that she's wasting money on, on something that she could have used it for another thing that in your mind is worth it. But to grandma, it's worth it. And so she would save and save and save to get that which is worth a lot to her. Are we together? And, and, and again, people might question our actions or attitude regarding why are you spending so much for that? You remember, um, that, you know, that kind of a uh, hypocritical way of thinking like, you know, you could do more with what you're doing. You remember in Matthew um, 26, 79, when it was worth, it was worth it for Mary to spend that amount of money on the, the yes. And there was some who were saying, oh, that money could have been spent for for the poor. You know, we could use it in today's vernacular, use it to buy more Bibles. Yes, you know, that kind of hypocrisy. 
but you did it because it was worth that to you. So we just want to look at again, when we talk about loving God, we sing, I serve a risen Savior. And the reason we know he lives because he's living within our hearts. Is he really? Is he really living within our hearts? But the question that, that stands before us right now is, how much is God worth to us? What is he worth to us? And the answer is not truthfully given by what we say, but by what is demonstrated. Amen. See, worth is a very important word to understand. I want us to give, a, give thought to this word again, worth. You see, worth speaks to, as a matter of fact, um, let me just say this. Have you ever been to an auction, an electronic auction, a house auction, or, or, or a, any one of these auctions, uh, car auctions? In fact, I've been to electronic auctions and car auctions before, and uh, it serves to give a very beautiful imagery of what things are worth to people. When you go to an auction, and you should go just to even hear how they talk. It's an interesting way how they speak, and uh, it's, really, it's really an experience. But at an auction, there is an initial buzz, an initial interest in the item up for big, bid by all. All who are at the auction, say it's a car auction or an electronic auction, you will have an initial interest by all regarding the item up for bid. And as, the, the, as soon as the, the bidding starts, all seem to have somewhat even a, a meager financial commitment to the product. But as the bidding gets higher, it escalates, it gets higher and higher, you're noticing the, the, the interest dwindles, dwindles. The crowd gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And what you find is that those who are really interested in the item stays on to bidding. They keep on bidding until eventually three, two, one. And then one person is left standing. And you will hear the announcer says, sold. And there's no real expression of joy, a real satisfaction of, of achievement. And you will see, or you'll probably hear them say, yes. Or there's, there's a, like a fist bump, you know, a, a show of fists like, yeah, we got it. Or I got it. Why? Why go through all this? We may wonder. You know, this person would have gone through all this. And the simple answer again is because of what it's worth to the person. So let me indulge your mind as to the meaning and implication of this word worth. The word worth is a very important word to take thoughtful note of because whether or not we know it or are consciously aware of it or even believe it, this is, is indeed true. Every moment of our lives is a revelation of what people or things or personal interests are worth to us. Give thought to that. Every moment of our lives is an indication, is, an ev is evidence to what people or things or personal interests are, are worth to us. And I want us to really think about this. Again, each person's life is a perpetual, a constant moment by moment revelation of who we are involved with, of what we're involved with, is worth to us. And yes, my brethren, our behavior or attitude to that person or thing, please note, always speak to or is a true indicator of the worth or its worth to us. Remember now, the word worth is, it means good or important enough to justify what is specified. That is, an example of that would be, it was let me say, the elders or the teacher's advice was worth taking. That's one way to look at worth. The teacher's or the elder's advice was worth taking. Another way, another meaning, another way the word is used. 
having a value or off or equal in value to as in money example you can say your computer is worth a hundred dollars is worth a hundred dollars so then we see that worth overall has to do with usefulness and importance as to the world or to a person for a specific and important purpose or function let's be very clear on this point as we move forward the word worth is indeed a subjective word by that we mean the worth of something the worth of something is determined by the person who is willing to pay for or exchange something of equal value for it for it for example if you Marie go into a store to buy a, a, a dress you might see a dress there for five thousand dollars and you would buy it because after having examined it you've determined it's worth that you might end up buying two now Sister Antoine, on the other hand, would probably hurriedly get out of that store and go to a store where she could get a deal for a dress, and especially one of those buy one, get one, another one free, and she'll get that dress for probably $50 because that is the price tag she thinks the dress is worth paying for. So we're seeing that worth is really subjective. It's what you are willing and what you've determined you will pay for something that you think is worth it to you. And so, we see that we can all agree, stay with me, we can all agree on this. The cost of a purchase or an item usually determines its worth or value. Are we together? The cost of an item or purchase usually determines its worth or value. And the worth or value of something is determined by how much someone is willing to pay for it. Well, that's why you see they put prices on things for a while, you know, after a while they take it down because nobody's buying it. You go into the stores and, and even the, 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 the auto malls and all these, and they have to reduce the prices because people are not thinking it's worth it. So the worth is really determined by what one is willing to pay for it. Are we together? Now, by demonstration and not by talk is the title of our presentation. Now turn with me to Matthew chapter 13 again, and we're going to look at verses 44 to 46. Three short parables, or very profound parables in three short verses. Just to look at this word of worth to us. 1344 to 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, which when a man had found, he hid it, and for joy thereof, goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buy that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and bought it. Now, just think with me with this. Here it is that we have this man, verse 44. He is, just, just kind of like, let's unpack this in our minds. Here it is that he's walking through the field. And he, let's say he probably is going through and he stubbed his toe. Bent down to address his hurting toe. And something got his attention. When he looks, his eyes popping open, he sees something on the ground or he sees evidence of something. And this curiosity leads him to, or led him to investigate even more. And then he's like, what? What am I looking at? What have I found? And he sees it's a treasure. And he, trying to compose himself, he calmly, and to the extent that he, he, he won't be noticed, bears the treasure, he hides it. And you can just imagine Imagine him briskly walking home to go sell all that he has to buy this. Now, he might, after he might be questioned by his friends and families, 
members of the family. Why are you selling all that you have to buy this, this, this field? That, that's, that's a very hurried move. Have you given thought to what you're doing? And some of you might even say, but why would they question that if he's going to buy fields with a treasure? Well, understand, this was happening in real time. They didn't know that. This is real-time experience for them. All they know that this man is going to sell, sell all that he has. He's selling all that he has to go buy this field. But he, because of what the field is worth to him, is not even given thought to that. He's not going to be deterred by their, their questioning or their, their suggesting that he is foolishly giving away or selling all his things. Sell most, if at least keep back a little for what we say, a rainy day. That's how we talk to each other. Keep back a little for a rainy day. But he's not doing that. He's selling all that he has to get this field. It is worth it to him. It is worth it to him. And even as you look at the other person, he now, he's, so you're, again, you're in the, in the mall. You all can identify with this man shopping for goodly pearls by our mall experiences. And so he's there with all the merchants, and they are looking around, and he sees a pearl, and this pearl grabs his attention. Something about the pearl makes him want to sell, again, sell all that he has to get this one pearl. And this is again because it is worth it to him. So what we're seeing in these parables is that there's a characteristic behavior that all are all function by when something is worth it to them it is not once something is worth it to you or to me we have a similarity in behavior we will do whatever is necessary we will make sacrifices to get it are we together Amen. now let me ask this question Does anyone here know what the, uh, the Christmas syndrome is? Have you heard the term? Let me tell you what the Christmas syndrome is. Christmas is usually time for? Gifts. 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 And so what the Christ Christmas syndrome really speaks to is this. You get the gift. And <laughs> by January or February you have no interest in the gift. It's a cycle. And that is why year after year, and I wish you parents will know this by now, you give the, the kids all the gifts, and by January, February, they don't even know where it's at. Or like Marie says, you just take it back. Some people just can't wait to take the gift. And some people like the fact that, they, that the store's tag is on it, and they will take it back and get back the money for it, and, and get something that they think is worth it to them. The Christmas syndrome. You get the gift by January, February, it's lost. Your interest is gone. So understand now that there could be an initial interest in something that's worth it to us, but it's only temporary, it's only momentary. And after which that interest is lost, it's not worth it to us anymore. And I want us to think about this in relationship to our professed belief. There was a time when Christ was worth it to us. And please note the verb tense. And the question is, is he still worth the same thing to us today? The answer is not by what we say, but by demonstration. Love is a functional word. And just like the people in the auction, at the auctions, different auctions, they evidence what what the thing is worth to them by demonstrating how much sacrifice they will make to what ends they will go to procure to, to, to get it. Once we find that our relationship speaks to this kind of a ritualistic behavior, we're here today because it's Sabbath, but is it new every morning in our hearts, the motivation to give God praise because of what he's worth to us? Or we're doing so because the Bible says so. The word worth is a subjective word, my brethren. And to every one of us, what God is worth to us is not what we say, but how it's evidenced in the life. 
What we are worth to God is not what he said. It's what he did to prove it. He demonstrated, he evidenced the fact that we are worth it to him by what he did. Enough of the talking. Enough of the talking. You know, what is the parable really saying to us? Is it not saying to us that when we find Christ, we are willing to give up all that we have, take the world but give me Jesus, because when we heard or we had this encounter, the good news of the gospel, we realized that that moment, what is it that God did? And we are moved by what he did. And we're at that moment willing to give up all to follow Jesus. And even as we would do that, our friends and families might even say that we are going off the deep. Wow, wow, you're all... You're, 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 you're part of a cult, you're acting really like a fanatic. Why are you so bent out of shape about this Jesus? But that didn't deter us. That didn't discourage us because the word worth and who Christ was and is to us at that moment was really the pervading thought of our minds. And so we were willing to take all the ridicule and be buffeted and be laughed at and be jeered and be mocked even because Christ was worth it, was worth it to us. You know, Jesus has this statement where he says, the love of many will wax cold. Talks about it in Revelation also. Many have lost their first love. Many have lost their first love. We know what that is like. We've had so many cycles in life where we have a relationship with each other and after a while we do not love them the way even in marital relationships we do not love them the way we started out loving them these are things that must be deeply contemplated this morning losing our first love but why it is because the word worth is not does not mean the same thing to us as the relationship evolved you know, let me just share something with us from inspiration. As I was reading this, looking at this text, I came across something from inspiration regarding these, this, these parables. Christ's object lesson, I think it was, the, the, the topic was the pearl. Notice what we're told. Christ himself is the pearl of great price. In him is gathered all the glory of the Father, the fullness of the Godhead. He is the brightness of the Father's glory, the express image of his character, his person. The glory of the attributes of God is expressed in his character. Every page of the Holy Scriptures shines with his light. The righteousness of Christ as a pure white pearl has no defect, no stain, no work of man can improve the great, uh, can improve the great precious gift of God. It is without flaw. You know, as I kept on reading this, my interest was heightened. Note with me. In the parable, the pearl is not represented as a gift. The merchant bought it at the price of all he had. In other words, gifts are not bought. Many question the meaning of this, since Christ is represented in scriptures as gift, as the gift of God. John 3, 16, 4, God so loved the world, scripture supplied. This is why the gospel of Christ is affordable to all, rich and poor, uh, rich and poor. No amount of worldly wealth can secure it. This reminds me of a study we had uh, uh, recently where some were coming to Jesus wanting to, having thought that salvation had an economic value. Matthew 19, remember that? 
But no amount of worldly wealth, Peter said, hey, look, look what we've done. What do we get for what we've done? The rich young ruler said, uh, you know, I'll give you, I'll do this and you give me that. But no amount of worldly wealth can secure it. It is of infinite value. Yeah. Now, when we hear that something is priceless, it doesn't mean that it's, it's, it's not, it's without price. It means the price cannot be computed. It's a priceless value. Notice now, the parable of the merchant man seeking goodly pearls has a double significance. Double significance? In other words, yes, there is a place that when we find Christ or when Christ found us, we would, we're willing to leave, leave all to follow him. And there's, that place for, there's a place for that. That, is, that part of the parable is true. But notice now, it, uh, it has a double significance. It not only applies to men seeking the kingdom of heaven, but to Christ seeking his lost inheritance. Amen. Christ is the heavenly merchant man seeking goodly pearls. He saw in lost humanity the pearl of price. In man defiled and ruined by sin, he saw the possibilities of redemption, hearts that have been the battleground of the conflict with Satan and that have been rescued by the power of love is more precious to God than those who have never fallen. I was thinking about this when we were reading the affirmation of faith. God looked upon humanity not as vile and worthless. That is, he looks upon me and you and the next man not as vile and worthless. Worthless, but worth it. Amen. Amen. He looked upon it in Christ and saw it as it might become through redeeming love. Having seen that, you know what he did? Notice, he collected all the riches of the universe and laid them down in order to buy the pearl. Are we appreciating what we're hearing? Are we appreciating what we're really hearing? See, do we see the word worth coming to view here yes. as it is relating to God? Yes. Again, he collected all the riches of the universe and laid them down in order to buy the pearl and said, for they shall be as stones of a crown lifted up as an ensign upon his hand. Zechariah 9 and verse 16. They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my Joel Malachi 3 and verse 17. And we remember 1 Samuel 1 and verse 8. He takes up the beggar from the dunghill to have them sit on his throne with him. Worth. That's what we're worth to God. My brethren, really, do we begin to appreciate what we have heard or are hearing? You know, as we've been saying, it's no longer by talk, but by demonstration, that the eyes of the universe will be opened as to who God is. We've been coming here for a while, and we've been saying for a while, yes, Lord, we really want you to come. But again, my brethren, I labor the point to our hearts this morning. God cannot come and will not come until he has, he's able to demonstrate in a people his love. By this shall all men know. When we love one another, when we have this love. So to keep saying that God is good, and then somebody says, all the time. That's not sufficient anymore. Amen. Satan has said, God is, in fact, look, Satan did tell one third of the angels believed that God is unjust and unfair. And he went to man in unfallen state and said, God is a liar and man believed. So it cannot be just stated that God is love. It must be shown, brethren, it must be demonstrated that this is so. And it starts with us, with each other right here in our homes, in the church. 
We're so intolerant of each other. We're so easily fickle. We're so easily bent out of shape. And then we sing, oh, I know Jesus lives within my heart. No, that's not true. Because love beareth all things, endureth all things, hopeth all things. Love never fails. Love never thinks of our own. It's the truth. I'm not making these up. I'm speaking to myself, granted. But unless the love of God is evident in the heart, by demonstration, the controversy will not be. And because Satan is charged that we, while in sinful fallen flesh, cannot perfectly reproduce this love. And God has said, I will have a people. And that is why the greatest, the great declaration of Scripture is, do you know what the great declaration of Scripture is? What is the great declaration in Scriptures? I hear it. No. Go ahead, Sister Carmela. That is the great declaration. When God is able to say, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. God is waiting for that moment. God has to be able to make that declaration. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. And the commandments are commandments of love. That is the great declaration of scripture. God is waiting to make that declaration, Vince. Here are they. Here are they. It has been charged that they could not do it. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. That is, keeping the commandments motivated by love. That is a great declaration in scripture. Here is. Jesus is able to present his bride to the universe. Think about that. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Let us contemplate something here about our worth to God. As we contemplate certain scriptures, first scripture I want to turn our attention to again is Isaiah 52 in verse 3. Isaiah 52 and verse 3. Psalms 44 and verse 12. Let's contemplate these scriptures again as we contemplate our worth to God. Isaiah 52 and verse 3 and uh, Psalms 44 and verse 12. Pay attention with me to these words. For thus saith the Lord, you have sold yourselves for naught and you shall be redeemed without money. You have sold yourselves for naught, and you shall be redeemed without money. Bear that in mind. Psalms 44 and verse 12. Next text, Psalms 44 and verse 12. Thou sellest thy people for naught, and dost not increase thy wealth by their price. If they're sold for naught, then there's no, there's no profit to gain. Just think about these scriptures. In other words, as Isaiah 40, 15, and 17 makes very clear the fact that because of sin, the worth of man has been reduced to nothing. Man has been reduced to nothing because of sin. And so, we're worth nothing. We've sold ourselves. Uh, let me see the hands of those of who buy something that's worth nothing. We would not do that. Or especially your hard-earned money. Buy something that's, that's worth nothing. I want us to understand what the scriptures are saying to us. Bear in mind Isaiah 52 and verse 3, that you have sold yourselves for naught and you shall be redeemed without money. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 6, as we keep these texts in mind. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20, 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 23. Look at 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20 with me. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20. And 1 Corinthians 7, 23, 6, 20. For we are bought with a price. For we are bought with a price. Are we together? You shall be bought, you've sold yourself for naught, but you shall be bought without money. But now we're seeing that we were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, the deep implication of this text, that if our lives are not living to really, in, in, real, in real glorification to God, in real praise to God, 
We're guilty of robbing God of that which is rightfully His. You are bought with your price. Notice what it says, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and spirit, which are? God's. What's your God's? We belong to Him. By creation and not by redemption. So, our lives should be really living, evidencing the love of God in the life. Because we belong to Him. Coming back to this verse a little. Verse 23 of chapter 7. You are bought with a price. Be not the servants of men. Hmm. Many of us will break our necks, run the traffic light, get angry to get to work on time to be the servants of men. And I'm here sometimes on a Tuesday night and there's one person here. I'm not telling... You just said never. Um, I will not respond to that on the mic. You know? Yes. One person here. And it's, it's the truth. Now I'm not telling you all to come here. That's not the point of that dimension here. It is for us to understand a dynamic in our lives. We are willing to be the servants of men even though we don't belong to them. And then we profess that we love God. That is the paradigm I want us to have in our minds to focus on this morning. Because to come here because of a presentation is wrong too. You must be motivated by what God is worth to you. Amen. That's the point. But we are more the servants of men than we are the servants of God. We don't belong to men. We belong to God. We are bought. We are His. But we will be torn apart if we're not able to satisfy man's agenda. And where God will understand when we treat his work indifferently or his cause indifferently. Oh, he understands. And then we're saying he lives it in our hearts. Not by talk anymore, brethren, but by demonstration. You know, this word botch, it's an important word. As I looked at it, Paul used this word very deliberately under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit granted. Because the word bought is from the Greek word agorazo. And it really means to buy, to purchase, to redeem. But note, but note, from the marketplace laying on the ground. Makes a lot of difference now. And the reason the word was used then to bring a very important point to the minds of the people back then and to us today. You see... Back then, sorry Vince, but back then, people used to have their market, you know, the, the, the market was done, in, it was constructed in a way that they have the canvases on the ground and stalls and they would put their things there. And people would go there and buy their produce and buy the things from the market. And when something, you know, we, we in today's requirement by FDA, once it has gone past its expir expiration date, it's not considered good for use for the most part. So back then, when something became worthless to them, it had no economic value, they would just throw it on the ground. So when you see that Greek word bought, laying on the ground, agorazo, it's very important to understand, because we were bought. In other words, when Christ came to buy us back, after we having sold ourselves out to Satan for naught, we were thrown on the ground. We're dumped. Nothing. It had no use for us after he, we, we sold ourselves to him for, for nothing. He just dumped us. And that's where Christ came and found us. Yeah. And bought us back from that. Hallelujah. And bought us back from that because we were worth it to him. Amen. Brethren, as a matter of fact, let's do this before we make this final point. First Peter 1, 18 to 20, the currency used for our purchase. Very familiar passage of scripture. First Peter 1, for as much as you know, 18, verse 18 to 20, for as much as you know that you were not bought back, redeem the word redeem, yes. bought back with corruptible things as gold and silver from your vain conversation, from um, and that conversation again, that word conversation from the Greek word anastrophe.
from your vein. In other words, it speaks to that which you, we would have inherited, the inherited way of life. We were not bought back from the inherited way of life. What was the inherited way? The corruptible seed. We were not redeemed from this corruptible seed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. As a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. The blood of God, the blood of Christ. And I say this to us this morning, it was only the blood of Christ that could have been used for the redemption of man. Not, the, not angel, not an angel, not all the angels, not even the Father. The blood of Christ. I want us to understand. The blood of Christ was the only currency that could have been used for the redemption of man. In other words, my brethren, as we give thought to what we were worth having sold ourselves out to sin, we're worth nothing. And Christ gave his life for nothing. Because in that he saw what nothing can become because of redeeming love. And this nothing called me because of Christ will be sharing his throne with him forever. Lifted up from the dunghill to inherit the throne of glory. Amen. That is because you, my brethren, you, Gina, you, Sister Octavia, you, my brethren, Jason and Raquel and all of us, Sister Brown, and to Jenny, all of us, Pablo, all of us, Carmela, Sean, Veronica, I, I call all the names, Yvonne. We were worth it to him. Marie, you were worth it to him. But if we're really thankful, if we're truly appreciative of this Christ and what he's evidenced by his demonstration, what we're worth to him, if we're really truthful about this, we would treat all men likewise. Amen. That's the evidence of it. We will demonstrate, we will by demonstration prove that yes, we appreciate what you have done for us by treating each other the same way. For in as much as you've done it unto one of these, the least, my brethren, you've done it to me. That is the essence of what this is all about. That we evidence that he is worth it to us and that we're grateful to him and we're thankful to him for what he has done and how he has evidenced all worth to him by treating all men like he would have treated them. Yes. Like he treats them. Yes. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we will be doing the same when that love is in us. Functional. And so today, my brethren, I want to just remind us not by talk anymore, but by evidence not by talk anymore, but by demonstration, the great controversy will come to an end. So that the great declaration can be made, here is the patience of the saint. Here, saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. What is Christ worth to us, my brethren? May that be the contemplative thought of our minds, even as we go forward today. Amen.